Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first seminar in our Wills and Probate Spring Seminar Series, which we are putting on in conjunction with Hugh James Solicitors. Each seminar is going to be lasting for about an hour and will feature three speakers followed by a Q&A session. Today's speakers are as follows. We have Jody Atkinson, a colleague of mine at St. John's Chambers, who will be speaking to us today about common intention constructive trusts in light of some of the recent case law in that area. We have Andrew Jones speaking to us about tax deduction certificates. Andrew is a senior associate at Hugh James, specializing in tax and a, with a particular emphasis on trust and estate taxation. And we are delighted that he's joining us today to give a talk. And I'm pleased to say he's also going to be hosting the Q&A session at the end. But before you hear from Jody and Andrew, I'm going to give you a roundup of some of the key contentious probate cases from 2020. Before I do so, however, I've been asked to give you the following information about Legal Network Wales and Legal Network London, which is a free referral and support network for law firms run by Hugh James. The network has assisted hundreds of law firms to retain their clients by offering expert legal advice in areas they do not practice in or are, or are unable to due to conflict. In return, the network can offer a fee share and a commitment that Hugh James will not poach, cross-sell or market their services to the referred clients. If you would like to know more about the network, please could you indicate this on the feedback questionnaire. And I'm reliably informed by our marketing team that when you leave this um, webinar, as if by magic, a feedback questionnaire will appear on your screen and we'd be most grateful if you could complete it and return it because it helps us in developing our marketing in the future. So with that start, I'm going to talk about the key cases from 2020. And to do so, I'm going to share my screen, which hopefully you can now see. Now, in terms of contentious probate claims properly so called, that is claims to challenge the validity of wills, the cases in 2020 seem to focus on two main areas, forgery and mistake. Forgery is going to be the subject of a separate talk by my colleague Annie Sampson from my chambers in the third and final webinar of this series. But mistake is the first topic I would like to discuss. Now, I'm sure all of you have come across the scenario where a testator excludes a person from benefit under his or her will for reasons which that potential beneficiary says are factually incorrect. I've been left out of the will for a reason which is simply wrong. If the testator has in fact made a mistake, to what extent can that be used to challenge the validity of the will? Well, in order to put the cases from last year in context, I need to draw your attention to two earlier cases, the first of which is called Rebellis. Rebellis is an old case which involved a testatrix who had two daughters and she made a number of wills leaving her estate equally between her two daughters. But suddenly she then made a final will in which she gave one daughter much more um, than the other. And that was because she mistakenly believed that she had previously given more financial assistance to one daughter than the other. And the will was held to be invalid for that reason. The logic as to why the will was held to be invalid was as follows. The judge said, the question again is not whether the will was avoided by a mistake of fact. Mere mistakes of fact as to previous persons or property would not stand in the way of probate. The crucial subjects of inquiry in the case are these. Did Mrs. Bellis make her will of 1927 revoking her will of 1922 under a supposition that the reapportionment made by the later will was required to restore equality? And was this supposition an insane delusion upon which her testamentary action of 1927 proceeded, or an illusory belief of such a character as may be held to displace the prima facie proof of testamentary capacity? So we see a clear distinction being drawn here between a mere mistake on the one hand, which is not sufficient to invalidate a will, and an insane delusion or an illusory belief on the other, and it's only that latter um, criteria which will be sufficient to invalidate the will. The case of Reed Bellis surfaced more recently in a case called Ball and Ball, 
in 2017, which is a decision of His Honour Judge Matthews, our local Chancery Judge in Bristol. Ball and Ball was a very sad case because it involved a testatrix whose husband had been imprisoned for sexually abusing three of their children. Those three children had reported the sexual abuse to the police and the husband had pleaded guilty to both indecent assault and incest. The testatrix made a will excluding those three children because she believed that her husband was innocent and the three children were at fault for reporting him to the police. The three children brought a probate claim to set aside the testatrix's will on the ground of mistake, but that claim failed. His Honour Judge Matthews held that this was a case of mere mistake, which didn't invalidate the will. His Honour said this, in my judgment, this case makes clear that mistake does not by itself operate to invalidate a will. What it can do, however, is to provide a basis upon which to say, in an appropriate case, that the testator is suffering from an insane delusion or does not possess a sufficiently sound memory for the purposes of making a will, but a mere mistake without more is not enough. Now, this is an interesting passage because His Honour Judge Matthews, as you will see, suggests that an insufficiently sound memory may itself be a ground for invalidating a will. In my view, I have to say that is somewhat questionable because the Court of Appeal has repeatedly emphasised, for example, in a case called Simon and Byford, that capacity is not to be equated with a memory test. And so simply not remembering things is not evidence of testamentary capacity. We now come to the first of the two recent cases from last year on the question of mistake. The first of which is the famous Lord Templeman case. You'll recall in that case that Lord Templeman's son challenged the validity of his will, which had been drafted by a solicitor who ironically had not followed the golden rule which Lord Templeman himself had prescribed. However, for, pre for present purposes, the interesting point about this case is that the son relied upon mistake. The case focused on a property called Mellowstone, which Lord Templeman had inherited from his wife, instead of it passing to the wife's relatives, the claimants. Lord Templeman had been heard to say that this was wrong. The son argued that this meant that Lord Templeman lacked testamentary capacity due to an illusory belief that a wrong had been done to the claimants, which had to be put right, and he relied upon rebellis. But that claim failed both on the facts and the law. As regards to the facts, it was held that when Lord Templeman had said that um, his inheritance of Mellowstone was wrong, he meant no more than that he should have received a life interest in the property rather than an absolute interest, so that on his death it would have passed to his wife's relatives. That was not an illusory belief on his part. But the claim also failed on the law, and it's interesting to see what Mr Justice Fancourt said. These comments are obiter because um, the case had failed on the facts, but it's interesting to see Mr Justice Fancourt's analysis. His Lordship said this, Rebellis was not a case of a mistaken belief that was capable of being corrected. It was a case of an illusory belief from which Mrs. Bellis could not be shaken and which deprived her of reason. I therefore reject the suggestion that Re Bellis stands as authority for the proposition that a mere mistaken belief, which is the product of forgetfulness, is inimical to the testamentary, to testamentary capacity. In my judgment, the president was not using the phrase illusory belief as meaning mistaken belief, but as denoting a kind of fixed belief similar in character to an insane delusion, which the testator does not have the mental powers to overcome. Now, there are two interesting points about this passage to my mind. The first is that Mr. Justice Fancourt appears to suggest that a mistake, which is the product of forgetfulness, is not enough to invalidate a will. That is rather different to the approach taken by His Honour Judge Matthews in the Ball and Ball case, who suggested that an insufficiently sound memory may be sufficient to invalidate a will. But Mr Justice Fancourt's approach is consistent with the Court of Appeals judgment in Simon and Byford that I've referred to, where the Court of Appeals said that the test for capacity is not to be equated with the memory test. And so in my view, Mr Justice Fancourt's approach is to be preferred. Secondly, Mr Justice Fancourt characterises an illusory belief as being one from which the testatrix could not be shaken and which deprived her of her reason, and appears to suggest that there's no difference between that 
and an insane delusion. However, in the next case we shall look at, the court took a rather different approach, which calls into question whether a claimant who alleges an insane delusion does indeed need to prove that the belief is, is one from which the testator could not be shaken. So let's have a look at that next case, which is the case of Clitheroe and Bond. This was a case in which a daughter successfully argued that her mother's mistaken belief that she, the daughter, was both a thief and a shopaholic was an insane delusion, which meant that the mother lacked testamentary capacity. One of the reason, one of the issues raised in that case was, what is the legal test for an insane delusion? After hearing full argument on that point, the judge, Deputy Master Linwood, held that the definition which one finds in a textbook, Williams, Mortram and Sonnox, was to be preferred. And that definition is as follows. Perhaps the best legal test for determining whether delusion is present in a person's mind is this. You must of necessity put to yourself this question and answer it. Can I understand how any man in possession of his senses could have believed such and such a thing? And if the answer you give is, I cannot understand it, then it is of the necessity of the case that you should say that the man is not sane. So that's a nice simple test. Essentially, if a testator believes something that no sane person could believe, they are suffering from an insane delusion. But note that contrary to what Mr Justice Fancourt suggested in the Lord Templeman case, this definition does not require the claimant to prove that it was impossible to reason the testator out of the belief. So if anything, Clith Clitheroe and Bond is a rather claimant friendly case which suggests that it might be rather easier for claimants to establish an insane delusion than had previously been thought, or certainly had been suggested by Mr Justice Fancourt in the Lord Templeman case. I'd like to move on to a different topic now in the time that I have left, <clears throat> and that is proprietary estoppel. The case you need to know about from last year in, on the topic of proprietary estoppel is a case called Horsford and Horsford which is an example par excellence of the proprietary estoppel case that goes horribly wrong. The case involved a mother and her son, Peter, who ran a farm in partnership with each other. The terms of the partnership were set out in a written partnership agreement signed in 2012, which included a term that when the mother retired, Peter had an option to buy her out. The mother duly retired, and Peter exercised his option to buy out her partnership share. But when Peter was asked to pay his mother what she was due, which was a very substantial sum in, in, of approximately two and a half million pounds, Peter refused. And he said, I've actually got a proprietary estoppel claim to the farm, which overrides the partnership agreement and means that I, that I don't have to pay my mother anything. That claim was obviously pretty un, unattractive, and in the result, it failed spectacularly at trial. First, the judge held that there had been in fact no promises made by the mother to Peter. The mother had mentioned that she intended to leave the farm to Peter, but it was held that those were merely statements of the mother's present intention, rather than irrevocable assurances which bound her. So in that respect, that this case was rather similar to the case of James and James, which is the proprietary estoppel case before His Honour Judge Matthews, where His Honour found, like in this case, that any promises were nothing more than a statement of present intention rather than irrevocable assurances. Secondly, the judge found that Peter, in any event, did not suffer any detriment in reliance upon any promises made to him by his mother. On the contrary, the judge found that his choice to stay at the farm and run it in partnership with his mother had resulted in him becoming a very wealthy man. He owned his own house, he owned another farm in his own right, he had his partnership income and a separate stream of income over and above that, so he had done very well out of his choice to stay at the farm. And if anything, he had benefited rather than suffered a detriment by reason of his choice to remain on the farm. But thirdly, and perhaps most interestingly, the judge held that even if an equity had arisen in Peter's favour by reason of the doctrine of proprietary estoppel, 
That equity was extinguished when Peter signed the partnership agreement, which contained express provisions to the effect that it, that is the partnership agreement, represented the entire agreement between Peter and his mother and superseded any earlier agreements which may have existed between them. So in light of those provisions in the partnership agreement, the judge said this, subject to consumer protection legislation, the parties to a contract are bound by provisions of this kind. Such clauses take effect by virtue of contractual estoppel. So the judge there was talking about this entire agreement clause where it was held that the partnership agreement superseded all previous agreements and contained all of the provisions agreed between the parties. But for good measure, the judge went on to say this, even if those specific clauses are ignored, the position would be the same. When a person has rights in respect of property and then enters into a contract which is inconsistent with the continued existence of those rights, the person is stopped from asserting those rights. Those rights are extinguished by the contract. So the moral of this story is that if you are acting for a claimant in a proprietary estoppel claim, who has entered into a partnership agreement with the other members of the family, then there is a real danger that that partnership agreement may give rise to a contractual estoppel, the effect of which will be to extinguish any proprietary estoppel claim that your client may have had, even if the partnership agreement does not contain an entire agreement clause of the kind found in Horsford and Horsford. Finally, the topic I'd like to turn to now is claims for an account. Ball and Ball, this is a separate case called Ball and Ball. It's not the Ball and Ball from 2017 heard by His Honour Judge Matthews. This is a separate case heard in 2020 by Chief Master Marsh. And it involved a claim by a claimant, a son, for an account to be given by the executors of his father's estate to explain to him what they had been doing and how they'd been acting in the administration of the father's estate. The claim was unsuccessful because it was held that the executors had in fact already provided an account in correspondence. And the interesting feature of the case is that the judge, Chief Master Marsh, explained what is required when an executor or trustee is required to give an account. Chief Master explained as follows. I accept counsel's helpful summary of what is required from the trustees in providing an account to the beneficiaries. One, they must say what the assets were. Two, they must say what they have done with the assets. Three, they must say what the assets now are. And four, they must say what distributions have taken place. It hardly needs to be said that the level of detail the trustees must provide and the formality of the statements and documents will vary with the size and nature of the trust. So in discharging his duty to give an account, an executor does not necessarily need to provide formal estate accounts of the kind that we normally see prepared by professional personal representatives. The account can be given informally by letter provided that it includes this key information set out in the, this helpful summary from Chief Master Marsh, and provided that it goes into a level of detail that is appropriate to the size and nature of the trust or the estate. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all. I've covered a lot of ground very quickly, but um, uh, necessarily so. I hope you found it helpful. And um, if you have any questions, then please raise them in the Q&A session towards the end. But in the meantime, I am going to stop sharing my screen and pass over to Andrew. Thank you, Alex. That's brilliant. There is a Q&A session at the end of this talk. Uh, you should all have a Q&A button on your screen, and that is the place to go in order to, to ask a question. Uh, You'll appreciate that most people on this call are, are muted and therefore you can't ask a question live out loud so it's the Q&A button is the place to go. And there we are, I'm now sharing my screen and I'm talking about tax deduction certificates. 
I have to admit, I was a bit shocked when I realised that over 100 people were intending to listen to me talking about tax deduction certificates because I was a bit fearful. It's a bit of a dry subject. It's not very sexy. There's not much human interest in it. I did ask around if anyone had a story about someone who had met their spouse due to an R185 tax form or had... Um, be murdered with an R185 tax form or a seagull who had stolen a chip with an R185 tax form, but sadly I don't have anything of that kind, so we're down to the dry numbers. I'm talking about tax deduction certificates, otherwise known as the form R185. Now there are a family of forms R185 and there are various different types of tax deduction certificate but the only two that I am going to talk about are the R185EI or R185 bracket estate income and the, so which is that one, and the R185TI or R185 bracket trust income, those bracket. Now, let's work from some very basic principles. Why are tax deduction certificates important to their recipients? Well, a tax deduction certificate in the context we're speaking of, arising in an estate or a trust, happens where the trustee or the personal representative has received some income. And having received that income, it's either already been taxed at source before they receive it, or they are obliged to include it on their own tax return and to pay tax on it. Having got a net amount of income, they then pay that out to their beneficiary. The beneficiary is entitled not only to receive the income, but also to receive a certificate of the income that they have received and the tax that has been deducted from it. There are two reasons why they need one of these. The first would be compliance. That is the beneficiary will have a tax return of their own to complete or other statements of their income that they need to complete and accordingly they will need the information that the tax deduction certificate contains in order to do that. Much more significantly in practice is the reclaiming of tax. Now uh, to give um, extreme examples of that uh, if you think of a non-taxpayer who has no other tax affairs, no other income, and then receives uh, £5,500 as a distribution from a discretionary trust, then their repayment on that could be £4,500. So it could be that we're looking at very significant sums of money in the context. Perhaps more, crucially again for a beneficiary, is a charity, because charities reclaim four billion pounds. Now, I have to say in fairness that I, I use the sum four billion in that big red star because it would have an impact and that that figure is the benefit that the government feel, you know, statistically, the government assess that charities gain from the benefits given to them by the tax system as a whole not just reclaims on R185s, but even so, the reclaim on the R185 is a very significant thing. And if you have charities as your beneficiaries, they really will care about it. So let's move on. The beneficiaries, they're most important for then non-taxpayers in relation to trusts, all individual taxpayers and charities. And I've picked on those three as examples, not because they're the only examples that exist, but because they are the three cases in which a tax repayment claim is more likely to be valuable to the beneficiary. Let's start by talking about the R185 for estate income. The basic principles here are that you prepare one R185 per beneficiary per tax year. It's only relevant to the years in which payments are made to beneficiaries. So if you're administering an estate which begins in the year of death, but your begins in the tax year of death, as it were, but the first payment you make out to a beneficiary 
of a, a residual beneficiary or any beneficiary that's entitled to income is the year following. It's only that second year that you would need to do an R185, a tax deduction certificate for. So they always go along with payments out to beneficiaries as distinct from going along with receipts of taxable income that you yourselves as PRs would be taxable on. The aggregate net income received overall should match the aggregate net income of all R185s overall. Uh, and I think if you're in a position where you want to assess whether the right amounts have been received, it seems to me that the estate accounts are a better starting point than the tax returns are for establishing that because there is not necessarily a correlation between the tax return for a year and the R185s for a year, but there should be a correlation between, at the end, all the income that's shown in a estate account as having been received and passed on, and the aggregate of all the R185s that you've produced and passed on to the beneficiaries. Now, what we used to do several decades ago was we would recalculate the tax paid to beneficiaries at the end of an administration period as if they had they received their income spread across it. Now, thinking about that you know, logically, I can see why it was considered by fair by someone in the dim and distant past that that should be done. However, the administrative difficulties of doing so far outweigh any practical advantages uh, that there would be. And fairness just balances out across, well, what the tax rates happen to change over time. So we no longer do that. Another thing that we also don't do is to give beneficiaries credit for tax at the same rate that was paid when it was suffered. We always give tax credits on the, at the rates which apply when the payment is made and the certificate is issued, which could be in a later year than the year in which the tax was received and so when the income was received and the tax suffered on it, and therefore could even be at a different rate of tax. So what we do do is uh, payments to beneficiaries are treated as income to the extent that there has been income. This is only true of beneficiaries who are entitled to the income of the estate, which in most cases, practically speaking, means the residuary beneficiaries. There are limited exceptions. Sometimes a legacy will um, uh, be paid uh, carrying its own tax. Uh, sometimes, sorry, uh, what I'm sorry, what I meant to say there was sometimes a legacy will be made carrying its own income. Uh, sometimes there will be an annuity, but in almost all cases, because those are very rare, in almost all cases, the only beneficiary entitled to the estate's income is going to be the residuary beneficiaries. So what you do is, if there is a £100,000 interim payment to the residuary beneficiary in the, say, the second year of the administration of an estate, then all income that has arisen to the executors and to the PRs up until that point is included in that payment. So if you say that's £10,000 net, then the other £90,000 will be treated as capital. In passing, uh, I'd contrast that with the situation of a discretionary trust where the trustees would in fact have some discretion, some choice about whether they think it's more appropriate to make a payment of income or to make a payment of capital and can choose which one they're doing. In an estate, that simply isn't the case. In an estate, it's simply if you make a payment to a residuary beneficiary, then to the extent that there's income arising to that date, that is part, the first part of that payment that you make out. Think about that hypothetically, if we'd received 20 of income and we'd only made a 10 distribution, then of course the whole 10 would all be income, none of it would be capital, and you've still got another 10, which will form part of the next 
residual distribution when you get around to making it. The income retains the nature that it had when it was received by the estate. So if it was interest, dividend, rent, etc., then the nature that it had then carries through into the tax deduction certificate. And it gets a tax credit which applies to that type of income at the date when it's paid out. So hypothetically, if the rate has changed, it's the rate that's at the date of the date of payment, not the earlier date of receipt by the PRs, but the later date of the payment by the PRs to the beneficiary. It's that later date's tax rate that would apply. For example, if you hypothetically, you know, I, I pluck these figures out of the air, you've got to go back quite a long way before you before you see years where there was a tax rate of 25%. But hypothetically, if the PRs receive some untaxed income in a year when the rate is 25%, they then include it in their own tax return for the year of receipt and pay tax at 25%. But if by the year it's paid out to the beneficiary, the rate has fallen to 20%, then that beneficiary gets a 20% tax credit on their tax deduction certificate. Now, where beneficiaries are individuals, tax deduction certificates are sometimes needed. My experience is that most beneficiaries in most circumstances aren't that bothered and don't need one, which is because most beneficiaries statistically are at the poorer end of the scale. They're not themselves submitting tax returns. They are um, not in need of this information in order to make a repayment claim. Their tax affairs are generally dealt with through a coding because they're pensioners or they receive uh, wages or a salary. So there's, there's nothing to be gained or not enough for the game to be worth the candle in receiving a tax deduction certificate and uh, submitting tax returns on their own behalf. However, the PRs do have an obligation to provide one. So if the beneficiaries want one, they must be provided with one. And uh, I, I, at some points, I, I remember at one point in my career, occasionally feeling the urge to argue with the beneficiary of actually, do you really need this? What are you going to use it for? But I, I think the answer is they are entitled. And if you're asked, just provide it because the PRs do have an obligation to provide a tax deduction certificate when they make payments of income. Uh, where the charity, where the beneficiaries are charities, however, um, if you are the charity, always ask for a tax deduction certificate. And if you are the PR or the solicitor, always provide one because the charity will always need one. Don't you know, don't even think of that not being part of your role in some way because it always is and the charity will definitely be on your case about it because from the charity's perspective their ability to reclaim tax on uh, the tax deductions from all the estates of which they benefit when aggregated together will prove to be an important part of, of the funding of their good works. Um, there is an interesting question about de minimis, that is, if it would cost more for tax deduction certificates to be produced and the figures are very, very small. I personally think the policy should be provide them anyway, if it's a charity at the other end. Um, but, you know, I can I can see circumstances where it's subject to could be subject to negotiation. It's I don't I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. I think there's a certain sense of being pragmatic and practical about that. Uh, if the solicitor is acting on a fixed fee or a ad valorem fee, then it seems to me that the solicitor should provide a tax deduction certificate, come what may, because it is part of the proper administration of the estate. So the, the question of is it worth producing a smaller one probably only comes up in estates that have you know, lay executives who haven't instructed professionals or cases where the professionals are working at an hourly rate and the charity is trying to minimize that because the estate is small. Types of income. Now in 
non-discretionary trusts and in estates, uh, you can classify income in the following ways. Untaxed income, so far as I can tell, should not arise in an estate because if untaxed income arose to the PRs, then the PRs would have a liability to pay tax upon it. Um, it can sometimes arise in the context of trusts where income is mandated to the beneficiary. Um, the, the reason now that we distinguish between savings income and non-savings income is that although the PR's liability on both is the same, uh, which is, has always been true historically, but at the moment it is, um, although the PR's liability on both will always be the same, the liability of the beneficiary could be different depending on whether the source of income is savings income, which mostly means interest, and uh, non-savings income. Uh, the other type of what we think of as savings income, but actually doesn't fall into that category is dividend income. And that's because it's non-repayable. Now there was, when this change was made, when dividend tax credits became non-repayable, there was some, some scandal about it. And it does seem to me rather unfair that there should be a tax credit, which can be set against your liability to tax, but cannot give rise to a repayment if you don't owe any tax. But uh, it seems to me also that the, the dividend rate, the, the tax credit on dividends has always been a notional number anyway. You have to go back many years before you find any real correlation between the amount of tax shown as a tax credit on a dividend certificate and the um, actual tax that was paid by that company in terms of corporation tax. But I, you know, obviously I'm digressing there in talking about policy. The, the practical point is that once, if income is dividends, then then it does get a, a dividend rate credit that's non-repayable. Um, finally, with discretionary trusts, you get uh, tax at the at the rate applicable to trusts, currently forty five percent. If you do have that, that is the one and only rate that you can give a tax credit for. So if a trust is a non-interest in possession trust, it can only include in a tax deduction certificate, tax at the rate applicable to trust and the only rate of tax it's allowed to show is the 45% rate. And uh, foreign income also, I won't go into that any further in this talk. So turning to the trust income one, it has the same principles we've already discussed. One form per, be per beneficiary per tax year only applies in a year when there was in fact a payment. In contrast that with settler interested trusts where a beneficiary will be liable, uh, well, not, a, not necessarily a beneficiary, the settler will be liable in any year in which the trust received an income. But for normal trusts, non-settler interested trusts, it's only the years of payment that count. Um, rates again are for those of the year of payment, not if applicable the earlier year of receipt by the trustees. And finally, there are tax pools. I won't go into tax pooling in this, but I will, I will trail the fact that uh, I do have a little seminar about tax pools, which I'm happy to give for those who find tax pools uh, a bit surreal and confusing, which in my experience is most people. <laughs> uh, if you're acting for the charity or if you are the charity, a few points on making a repayment claim based on a tax deduction certificate. Um, the time limit is four years from the end of the tax year. And I was surprised by the number of means by which uh, the repayment claim can be made. Uh, the revenue still have apparently not retired the forms CHR1, therefore the claim can be made using that if you want. Uh, for those of you who know what an R40 is, the CHR1 is sort of the, an equivalent of that to a charity. Probably most charities will utilise the government gateway uh, and in some cases the charity will be required to submit a company tax return or a trust and estate tax return and if they do so that's also an appropriate place to obtain their tax credits. So thank you everyone for that. I will now pass on
Uh, oh, hang on. I will now stop sharing my screen and then we'll pass on to Jody. Thank you. Over to you, Jody. Okay. Hello, I'm Jody Atkinson. I hope you can all see my PowerPoint now. Um, happy anniversary, virusary. Um, it's been almost a year, so it's coming up now for all of us. And hopefully we'll be able to have these meetings again in person soon. Uh, but for now it's still webinars. Um, as we all know, um, situations where there's a dispute about whether a deceased person co-owned property with someone or where they co-owned the property with someone and there's a dispute about what the shares are, um, are on the up. Um, and you have situations involving unmarried partners, uh, situations involving siblings, uh, situations involving an adult child. Um, and while I'm sure a lot of people in the audience will be thinking, well, if that happens, I'm going to hand it off to someone else to litigate it. Um, it's important to be able to spot them when they come up and be aware of the issues so that you can spot those kind of issues when clients start telling you about um, that sort of situation. So I've got three um, hot off the press cases for you involving constructive trusts. Um, and I'm going to start with O'Neill and Holland, um, which is the Court of Appeal case in that bundle. Um, so this is a, a cohabitee case. Um, Miss O'Neill and Mr. Holland were in an unmarried relationship. They had three children. Uh, during the relationship, 12 buy-to-let properties were acquired in the sole legal name of Mr. Holland. Um, the family home was also um, it registered in Mr. Holland's sole name. But there was a more complicated background in respect to the family home, and we'll come back to that one. So when the relationship ends, uh, Miss O'Neill brings claims that she has an equal beneficial share in all of the buy-to-let properties and also an equal share in the family home, despite the fact they are all registered in Mr Holland's sole name. So in respect to the buy-to-let properties, um, the court, the court, the first instance judge, the district judge, concluded that Miss O'Neill's claim failed. Um, the district judge found that there was no agreement, express or inferred between them, that the, there was an agreement that the buy-to-let properties would, would, should be jointly owned. Um, on the contrary, the judge found that it was clear that these were intended to be Mr Holland's sole business, and thus the beneficial ownership reflected the legal ownership. Um, and the district judge said, quote, any assistance which she, Miss O'Neill, had given him, Mr Holland, in relation to their business was explicable on the basis of their personal relationship. But the situation as the family home, as I said, was different. Um, and that's the interesting part of this case, really, because the family home had been purchased at auction by Miss O'Neill's father, Mr O'Neill, using his own money and had been placed initially in Mr O'Neill's sole name. But Mr O'Neill had never lived there. It had always been, been intended by him um, to be used as a family home for Miss O'Neill, Mr Holland and their children. And they lived there for several years and it continued to be registered in Mr O'Neill's sole name. Then Mr O'Neill decided to transfer it to them. And the initial intention was that Mr O'Neill was going to put it into their joint names, into Miss O'Neill and Mr Holland's joint names. But um, Mr Holland, by this point, was already planning to immediately mortgage the property to release some money to invest in his buy-to-let fledgling empire. And the mortgage offer that he'd obtained was in his sole name. So, rather than wait to get a new mortgage offer, Miss O'Neill agreed to the property being transferred into Mr Holland's sole name. Now, the district judge found that this agreement showed that there was a common intention that it should be held as beneficial joint tenants. The family home should be held as beneficial joint tenants because Miss O'Neill had agreed to it being placed in Mr Holland's sole name rather than their joint names. Mr Holland appealed and his appeal went first to a circuit judge. And his appeal was on the basis that Miss O'Neill, the claimant, had not shown any detrimental reliance on this supposed agreement, and therefore a constructive trust was not possible. All of the financial contribution, and therefore, Mr Holland said, the detrimental reliance came from her father, not from her. 
and the circuit judge agreed with this, with the result that Miss O'Neill's claim had entirely failed because she'd lost on the buy to let and she'd lost on the family home as well. So Miss O'Neill was now a woman with nothing to lose, so she decided to appeal onto the Court of Appeal. So this is a second appeal. Well, the first thing the Court of Appeal discussed was, is there a requirement for detrimental reliance at all in common intention constructive trust cases? And the reason they looked at that question is because if you read Kernow and Jones, they don't talk about detrimental reliance, the Supreme Court in that case. So some people are like, were suggesting, well, maybe it's not an element anymore. Well, the Court of Appeal squashed that. They said, of course, detrimental reliance is still a requirement for a constructive trust case because it's the claimant's detrimental reliance that makes it unconscionable for the defendant to resolve from the, the representation and allows equity to intervene. And you may remember that phrase from law school, equity will not assist a volunteer. Well, it, it's not a saying that I think is very helpful because nobody normal uses volunteer, the word volunteer in that sense anymore. Um, but however, what it means is equity will not assist a person who has not done anything. They need to have relied on the representation and incurred some detriment before equity will assist them. But what sort of detriment do they need to have to prove? Well, the Court of Appeal in this case gave detriment the widest possible interpretation they could have done, with Lord Justice Hen Henderson saying, quote, detriment in this context is a description or characterization of an objective state of affairs which leaves the claimant in a substantially worse position than she would have been but for the transfer into the sole name of the defendant. Although the facts which constitute the detriment need to be pleaded, their characterization is ultimately a matter for the court in the light of all the evidence adduced at trial. So was it a problem that the detriment in this case really seems to flow from um, the father rather than the daughter from a third party? No, because the Court of Appeal said, <clears throat> viewed objectively, Miss O'Neill had exchanged a situation where the property was in the sole beneficial ownership of her father and she was able to occupy it rent free as her family home for the foreseeable future for a situation where um, the beneficial interest was presumptively rested and vested in Mr. Holland alone. So she was worse off um, and therefore she had incurred a detriment. So you can see from this that the court will usually be able to find detriment if it wants to do so, uh, because if the it's a slightly circular definition, because if the person wasn't worse off, why would they be bringing the claim? Um, and a, a side note to this case is something called the equity of exoneration, a principle called that. Um, now you'll recall when we went back to it, the reason the mortgage had been taken out on the property was for Mr. Holland's sole business purposes, as was established in the case, the buy to lets were his sole business, they were in his sole name, they were his sole, for his sole benefit. And therefore, under this principle equity of exoneration, that meant that the mortgage against the family, even though the court upheld the decision that the, the property was held 50-50 between them because of the common intention constructive trust. In fact, Miss O'Neill did better than that because the mortgage against the property sat entirely against Mr. Holland's half share because of this equity of exoneration principle because the mortgage had been solely taken out for his business purposes. And that's a principle that we've had a couple of cases on, um, comes up a bit more because people are more aware of it. Okay, that was O'Neill or Holland. Now onto the next um, case, um, Oberman and Collins, another um, very, we're scooping for that, um, another unmarried relationship, two children this time. Uh, the parties have a, have a company as well called Blue Gen. We'll come back to that one. Um, they had a few more buy to let than O'Neill and Holland, a veritable empire with over 40 properties. Um, and unlike in O'Neill and Holland, they're not all in the man, uh, Mr. Collins's name. So again, some are in Miss Oberman, the, the woman, the claimant's name, some are in Mr. Collins's name, some are in joint names, some are held by this company, Blue Jam. So uh, Miss Oberman contended that they had a common intention that all of the properties were held on trust for both of them in equal shares. 
Um, and in terms of evidence, she had some good evidence. She had a helpful email uh, that Mr. Collins had written um, stating that, quote, this, meaning the buy to let properties, has all been purchased for the benefit of both of us, irrespective of whether they have been purchased in my name, your name, joint name, or in Blue Jim's name. And Miss Oberman also had the considerable advantage that it turned out that Mr. Collins had gone to prison early in their relationship for false accounting and had what politely could be called credibility issues. And uh, Mr. Uh, Collins had also offered earlier on in the separation, he made an open offer to just divide the whole portfolio 50-50 equally between them. Uh, but then various things had happened um, the relationship had deteriorated even further um, and he would resolve from that position and rode back from it and said, in fact, the ownership is as, a, as at the legal title. So the issue that Mr. Collins really raised was what I call the portfolio problem. Was it an issue um, that the court was, rather than being concerned with one property, the court is looking at a portfolio of properties? Mr. Collins contended that it was. He said it was necessary to look at, analyze the ownership of each individual property separately and for a common intention to be proved separately for each property, which would of course be a lot harder to do. Well, that contention was re rejected by the Deputy High Court Judge, Tom Leach QC, who said, quote, Mr. Collins's counsel submitted that a separate analysis was required for each individual property, and it was necessary for Miss Oberman to establish an express interest or common intention to be inferred from conduct that she would have a beneficial interest in each one. I reject that submission. I can see no reason why the common intention doctrine should not apply to a portfolio of properties, even one fluctuating over time. The court can give effect to a common intention constructive trust of each individual property by drawing the inference that the parties intended to acquire it in equal shares from their express agreement in relation to the portfolio more generally and their subsequent conduct in relation to the use of the rents and profits and proceeds of sale. So Mr Collins made the same point in relation to detriment. He said Miss Oberman needs to show detrimental reliance in respect of each property and it will come as no surprise that this was also rejected because the judge held that the detrimental reliance had to be referable to the common intention. It did not have to be in relation to the property. And in that, he went back to a case from the 1980s, a court of appeal case called Grant and Edwards. And in that court of appeal case, uh, the court of appeal said, quote, once it has been shown that there was a common intention that the claimant should have an interest in the house, any act done by her to her detriment relating to the joint lives of the parties is, in my judgment, sufficient detriment to qualify. The acts do not have to be inherently referable to the house. And that's an important principle to bear in mind. When you're looking for detrimental reliance in this case, naturally one will look at detrimental reliance directly in relation to the property that's been argued about, but one can other, you've done other things, nothing to do with the property, um, that can still count as detrimental reliance, as long as the reason you've done those other things is because um, you've been relying on this common um, intention representation that's been made to you and you've assumed that it's binding and it will be acted upon. In this case, Miss Oberman doesn't need to show a separate detriment in respect of each of the 40 properties. She just needs to show detriment in relation to the common intention with regards to the portfolio as a whole. And uh, the judge said that she was able to do so um, because of her financial contributions, even though they were very small in comparison to the huge value of the portfolio and were all made at the outside. Her working in the business, which as we saw in the O'Neill dispute, helping in the business won't, absent a representation, will not get you an interest. But if there is a common intention, working in the business can be detriment. Assuming financial liabilities in relation to the portfolio, because she was a joint signatory to some of the mortgages and things like that. And an interesting one, giving control over the portfolio to Mr. Collins by allowing Mr. Collins to run the whole show, which he did, 
she was therefore detrimentally relying on his assurances to her that it was a everything was joint. Okay, so that's the um, <clears throat> trust of land side of it. But the other interesting thing about the Oberman case is that as well as having a trust dispute, that wasn't enough for these parties, the parties also decided to have a Section 994 Companies Act dispute. That's this ability for a shareholder to bring an unfair prejudice petition. And the court was willing to list both of these cases to be heard at the same time by the same judge. Now, a company dispute and a joint ownership dispute, double whammy, is one that's coming up in my practice a bit more often because, again, parties largely for tax purposes um, are increasingly advised to put assets into limited companies. So, and I'm sure you're seeing in your estates situations where there's a company which holds some asset and the deceased held some shares, but then his unmarried partner held some shares, his adult children held some shares, his brothers hold some shares. And then when someone dies, it is going to fall on us lawyers to sort it all out for them. So this is something you need to know about because this is the ultimate way, really, you're going to end up sorting it out if it comes to it. And the good news is that Section 994 gives a surprisingly flexible remedy to the court, given we're talking about company law, which doesn't have a reputation generally for being flexible. So <clears throat> um, what happened in, you'll remember in Oberman, uh, Oberman and Collins, the man and the woman, had this company called Blue Gen that they set up at the beginning of the relationship. And Miss Oberman had 49% of the shares and Mr. Collins had the 51% of the shares. And the company was concerned with holding and managing yet more buy-to-let properties. And as soon as the relationship broke down, Mr. Collins, who had basically run the business during the relationship, completely excluded Miss Oberman from the running of the company. And Mr. Collins began doing other things as well. He began running up large debts um, to another company that he controlled 100% of the shares of um, by doing works on the alleged works on the businesses. And he also began granting some leases over some of the properties which were not kosher, basically preferential leases, again, to other companies that he controlled. Now, the court concluded that this was unfair prejudicial conduct in the running of the company. And that the remedy, which the court's got a wide discretion to just make an order as it sees fit, but this is the order that they usually make in these unfair prejudice case. Uh, the order was that Mr. Collins was ordered to purchase Miss Oberman's 49% shareholding. And in order to arrive at the price at which Mr. Mr. Collins would have to pay, there would be a single joint expert market valuation. And there would be no discount for a minority shareholding. So it would be 49% of the value of the company overall. And um, the really interesting thing and the useful thing about this particular case is court made it very clear that the valuation was to take place as if it, the prejudicial conduct hadn't happened prior to the prejudicial con conduct. So when the, the single joint expert values Blue Gen, they ignore the debts to Mr. Collins's company that he's created and they ignore the dubious leases uh, that Mr. Collins has granted to other companies he controls. It's the valuation prior to that. And so it's easy uh, to see the potential for similar things to happen wherever there's a family company and someone dies, uh, because it's always a possibility that the other, well, the other shareholder in practice is going to start running the show because the, the, the business partner shareholder has died. Um, but the, it's easy to see how the other shareholder is going to run the, run the company with no regard to the estate and indeed start stripping out assets like Mr Collins tried to do in this case. And you can see there is a remedy in those situations. And this is the sort of remedy that you might be signposting people towards. So last case, Ralph and Ralph. Ooh. So <clears throat> this is a bit different. Um, it's a rather than a dispute where those previous two are where you're saying, oh, the title register is not accurate in that I should be on it. This is one where both parties are registered on the title, um, but they're arguing about what the beneficial ownership should be. Um, and it's a dispute between a father and a son rather than unmarried partners. And again, so that's another situation where you can quite easily see this coming up in an estate um, because um, what had happened was that the father had wanted to purchase a property 
um, but due to his age and income, he was unable to raise a mortgage by himself. So he had brought his eldest son on board and the property um, had been registered in their joint names. But the father had provided all of the deposit and the father had paid all of the mortgage instalments. And indeed, the father had lived there without the son being there at all for most of the period. Um, and so that's probably, you know, that's something given it's very difficult to buy a property outright because of the value of property nowadays. And it's hard to get a mortgage once you're of a certain age. This is a scenario which we're, you're going to see quite a lot, I think, in estates where um, it's been necessary to bring someone on board to get a mortgage. And, and we've seen it in the past. I've seen it in cases where there was a right to buy property. Anyhow, um, we have done some market research about our audiences, and it turns out the thing that the audiences are really keen on is numbered forms. So we've already had Andrew give us a great talk about the R185 form, but I know that won't be enough for you. So I'm going to bring in another form here, form TR1. Um, unlike Andrew, I didn't, and I might, if I do this talk again, I might get the form so I can ping it up on screen. Uh, but I think a lot of you will know this form. This is the form that you sign when you, whenever you're doing a land transfer or you're purchasing a property. This is like the final form that's executed as a deed that you send to the land registry that they actually then prompts them to register it into joint names. And it has the all important box 11 um, where there is a tick box and you can tick beneficial joint tenants, beneficial tenants in common, or you can tick something else and write in the something else. Um, and in this form, the box had been ticked in order to declare a trust, quote, as tenants in common and equal shares. And, and the ticking of that box and the significance of that box being ticked takes us back to another court of appeal case, which I find is one that I cite all the time, where box 11 was held to be central. And that is uh, Pancania and Chandigra from 2012. Um, and the facts of that case were fairly similar um, to um, the facts of Ralph, in that the claimant in that case was the defendant. The defendant was the claimant's aunt, and the aunt needed to buy a house, and the aunt had provided all of the funds, but the aunt, again, due to her age and income, was unable to get a mortgage. So the, the nephew, the claimant, had popped up and been added to the mortgage. The property, however, had been registered in joint names, once again, box 11 on the TR1 form has been completed um, with the option ticked that they'd hold it in beneficial tenants and common and equal shares. And in Chandigra, the child judge had found that the claimant had never entitled, intended to live there. He was only on the title as, quote, a make weight so the defendant could get a mortgage. And so the trial judge concluded that there was a common intention, constructive trust, that the property was to be held 100% for the defendant aunt. However, the Court of Appeal said it's not open to the trial judge to do that um, because the Court of Appeal pointed out that the, the trial judge had referred to Stack and, Stack and Jones and uh, Stack and Dowden and Kerno and Jones. And the Court of Appeal pointed out in those cases, there'd been no express declaration of trust. The reason being that the wonderful TR1 form only came into, into use in 1998. And before that form, the TR1 form came in, there was a different form which didn't have this tick box on it. So there wasn't the option to declare a trust. Now the form does have the option to declare a trust. And when that bit of the box is completed, an express declaration of trust has been made. And they said, quote, a declaration of trust is regarded as conclusive unless varied by subsequent agreement or affected by proprietary estoppel. And, quote, a declaration of trust can be set aside for fraud, mistake or undue influence, but nothing of that kind is alleged in this case. So surely the father in Ralph is stuffed in the same way that the aunt in Chandigra it had been. Well, the, the father had set out in his in his evidence that the completion of um, the completion of box 11, the ticking of that box was a mistake. A solicitor or some conveyancer had ticked it for them. Neither of them had, been, had ever intended beneficial joint ownership. 
The trial judge accepted the father's evidence and held at the trial that what the father was seeking here was rectification of the form TR1 on the grounds of a mistake. And he was, and the trial judge was willing to make that order and rectify the TR1. The son appealed to the high court and appealed on, on a technical basis. He said, the father has never made a formal counterclaim for rectification. He said, in, and the son cited various decisions where judges had referred to the necessary of rectification claims being, quote, pleaded. Well, um, the High Court rejected that appeal. Um, they said, although it's best practice for a claim for rectification to be pleaded and made as a separate counterclaim, there's no legal requirement that it had to be, and it's open to a court to grant rectification in the absence of a formal pleaded claim. And indeed, there was no real prejudice to the son in the court doing so, because he had always known from his father's witness statement that his father's case was that the completion of box 11 was a mistake because the father had said so very clearly. And the High Court also said that it wasn't a problem um, for the father that he was unable to point to any evidence at the data transfer as to an express agreement as to what the beneficial interest should be. It was sufficient that the father had convincing evidence that 50-50 beneficial ownership was definitely not intended and that the completion of the TR1 box 11, the ticking of that box, was a mistake. Because on that basis, the court could grant rectification by removing the tick in the box, because you know, that's the way rectification works. You actually strike through words or add words. Um, and the court could then leave the parties in a position as if the property had been conveyed into their joint names with no declaration of trust. As I pointed out, on a stack, that's that's what happened in Stack and Dowden, no declaration of trust. That's what happened in Kernel and Jones, no declaration of trust. And in Stack and Dowden, they said where there's no declaration of trust and the intention is not to hold it as beneficial joint tenants, then the court can embark um, on, a, on looking at the whole course of dealings to impute what the, the, the appropriate outcome was. And in this case, the court could conclude on the basis that the father had provided 100% of the funds, paid 100% of the instalments and lived there, basically with the son never being there, that the beneficial interest correctly was 100%. So, as I say, given situations where older people are going to require mortgages to purchase houses are increasingly common, this is a case worth remembering because this is precisely the sort of situation that can come up and you can see how there would be a dispute between, you know, the same dispute but this time the father's dead rather than having had the falling out with the son. And on one side, you have the, the claimant's son saying, this house belongs all to me or 50% to me. And then on the other side, you have the, the other siblings going, dad never intended to give you the house. You're just on the child 